All right. Good evening, everyone. Well, everyone is just the TA, I guess. Um, so we are recording now. So let's uh, let's complete what we are trying to do. We are trying to prove the max flow min cut theorem using LP duality. All right. Um, so I made one uh, mistake, which I want to correct. So note that in the max flow min cut theorem, the capacities are not necessarily integral, right? So what I said that the feasible region is integral for the primal problem is actually incorrect. Okay, so I'm just going to erase this. We are not going to need this. Right? All right, we will use integrality, not for the primal, but for the dual. Uh, that's where I got confused. All right, so that's that. And um, yeah. So I wrote this as a try it yourself problem. I'm going to erase this so that I can use this space. Uh, it's already on Piazza. All right, so um, what we did note correctly is that the feasible region of the dual is integral. Uh, this was because of the dual that we wrote in this manner, and then we applied theorem 5.10, the last statement. Okay, so this LP looks exactly like uh, the theorem statement. Uh, you can go back to the theorem and check it. And there we noted that the feasible region will be integral. Notice that the matrix A, and therefore its transpose is unimodular, and then we are adding Z, so that is A transpose followed by the identity matrix. And the right hand side, the vector D, D is actually a 0 plus 1 minus 1 vector, right? In fact, uh, by our assumption, it is just going to be zeros and plus ones uh, because there are no incoming arcs into S. So the right hand side is an integral vector, the left hand side is our unimodular stuff. And therefore, we get that uh, totally unimodular stuff. Therefore, we get integrality. So even if the capacities are not integral, the capacities are only the objective function, so they don't affect the feasible region. Okay, so this part is correct. Uh, all right, so now what we want to do is we want to look at the dual, but not this form of the dual. We will look at, um, let's see. Yeah. In fact, no, this is right. We will look at this form of the dual itself and try to understand why this actually captures the uh, minimum capacity cut problem. All right. So the next goal is to examine the dual and relate it to the min st die cut problem. All right. OK, so I want to look at these constraints and try to understand what they are really trying to say. All right, so in order to do that, we will break our its arc set of the graph into four smaller sets and think about each kind of arc separately. Okay, so our arcs of the graph, there are those arcs which are not incident at S, neither incident at S nor at T. Let's call it E0. Okay, so this is um, not O, this is 0. Then there are arcs which are incident at S, so they are outgoing from S, but they are not going into T. Okay, so these are arcs that look like this. This is S and this is some vertex V, which is not equal to T. Then there are arcs which are entering T, but are coming from some vertex U that is not equal to S. Okay. And finally, there is there could be an arc going directly from S into T. 
if there is such an arc, otherwise this will be the empty set. Okay. So this is a disjoint union. One way to think about it is to, I mean, represent it is to put a dot inside the union. Okay, so they are all disjoint sets and together they comprise all the arcs of our graph. All right. And now let's think about what happens for each kind of arc. So let's consider a UV in E0. Okay, so the tail is U and the V is the head. Okay. So now let's think about the A transpose matrix, right? So let's remember how did we get this matrix? The matrix A is the um, vertex arc incidence matrix. And so we are transposing it. So now for each arc, we will have a row and we will see a minus one and a plus one for the tail and the head respectively. Okay. So, um, yeah. Sorry, for the, yeah, so a plus one and minus one for the tail and the head. We are putting a plus one for the tail and a minus one for the head, right? So we'll get yu minus yv plus zub is greater than or equal to the right hand side. What is the right hand side for this kind of arc? Um, can you think about the vector D and tell me what the right hand side will have for this kind of arc? Remember the vector D is the, it's the vector where we have plus ones only for the arcs that are going out of S because it is calculating the value of your flow, right? So for an arc UV, which is not incident at S, the entry on the right-hand side will be simply zero. Do you all agree? Yeah, okay, thank you. I guess that's mother. All right, so that's um, arcs in E0. Now let us consider an arc in ES. So the tail is S and the head is some vertex V. Okay. So for this kind of an arc, um, let's see what happens. Can someone tell me what will the, what will the constraint look like? Remember we, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, you're saying something? Uh, the same as above, but just D instead of zero. Um, but will there be a YS or will it not be there? Try to remember the matrix A again. We removed two rows from that matrix. Do you remember that? Hmm. Right, so hmm. actually the Y S will not be there. So this entry will be empty. We'll have a minus Y V plus Z um, S V. And what about the right hand side? I think you mentioned the right hand side probably correctly. D. D um, S. Oh, right. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, so what is the D vector in the entry for the vertex S for this particular arc SV? Right, the D vector is adding all the flows on the arcs which are going out of S. So we should have mm -hmm. a plus one there, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, great. So that is the, that is those arcs which are going out of S but not going into T. Now let's think about arcs which are going from a vertex U, which is not S into T. So those are the set ET, arcs of the set ET. 
So what do we get in this case? Right, so we remove the row for S and T. So this time we will have simply a YU plus ZUT, right? Yeah. And on the right hand side, we will have this Minus. is called the vertex T. Uh, not quite. It will actually be zero because the vector D is simply, it only cares about the arcs going out of S. It doesn't care about the arcs going anywhere else, right? So if it is not incident at S, then it's going to be a zero again. Hmm. Yeah. And now let's look at finally, if there is an arc going directly from S to T, which will therefore belong to the set EST. Okay, so what about this arc? Um, what will happen in this arc? Well, both the rows have been removed, right? So it's the left hand side is actually very simple. It's simply going to be Z S T. And what about the right hand side? One. One, exactly. Great. Because it is going out of S, therefore it has been added in the vector D. It has been included in the summation. Right? So these are our four constraints. All right. Now, so we have four different types of constraints for the different types of arcs. Uh, but maybe we can unify them by doing some trick. Okay, so that's what we are going to do. We are going to unify them by a certain trick, which we will see soon. And then we are going to relate this to the main ST die cut problem. Okay, so how would we unify this? Does anybody have any ideas on how to unify this? Is there a way to sort of unify these four types of constraints? Well, first of all, let's make the right hand side zero, right? If you want to make the right hand side zero, then uh, we just need to move those ones to the left hand side. Okay, so let's do that. Um, so what we'll do is we will introduce constants to capture those minus ones. Okay, so these two ones, if I move them to the left side, they will become minus ones and the vertex that is not appearing in these constraints is the S vertex, right? So I'm going to introduce a constant Y S and I'm going to call it minus one. Okay. So let we introduce a constant Y S and we will set it to minus one. Okay. If I do that, I'll just make changes here itself. Um, actually, let me just, yeah, let me just uh, rewrite some constraints, right? So let me write the, let me call these one, two, three, and four. Okay, so if I do that, the second constraint will now look like Y S, Y S minus Y V plus Z S V, is greater than or equal to zero. Yeah, because I've set y s to be minus one. And similarly, the fourth constraint, but before I write down the fourth constraint, let us also try to deal with the third constraint. Okay, so the thing that is missing there is a variable for the vertex t. So let's just set y t to be zero. Okay, so we will introduce two constants. Y T equal to zero. And if I do that, the third constraint will become Y U minus Y T plus Z U T 
greater than or equal to zero. Yeah, which looks very much like the first and second constraints at this point. Okay, and now observe that the fourth constraint also looks like that. The fourth constraint is simply y s minus y t plus z s t greater than or equal to zero. Right? Y s takes care of the one on the right hand side. Y t does not do anything, and that's it. Okay. So now, if we do this, then basically all constraints look like the first constraint. Okay. So now we rewrite the dual. Okay, let's just write, rewrite the dual. So the dual is simply our previous dual. Um, minimize C transpose Z. So I'm going to write down this as a summation now. So for all arcs, we are adding C E Z E subject to we will just write down the first constraint because we have unified all of them. So y u minus y v plus z u v is greater than or equal to zero. This is for all arcs in the set. And we need uh, these dual variables which are set to constants. Those are y s minus one. Y t is zero. Oh, and we forgot to write the z vector is non-negative. Okay. So that is our dual. Does everybody agree? Are there any questions or concerns at this point? Right. We have only found a way to unify the constraints by introducing artificial constants. Right. So they are variables, but we have set them to be constant by putting equations in our linear program. OK, so once we do this, we get this as our dual. All right, great. So now what we are going to do is the last part. We are now actually going to relate this to the min ST die cut problem. So this dual is much easier to relate to the min ST die cut problem because we have just one way to think about all the arcs rather than distinguishing between them. Okay, so here is my claim. The optimal value of the dual, so the value of an optimal solution of the dual, which is the notation I've been using in some assignments, is exactly equal to the Minimum capacity of an ST die cut. Okay, so we need to prove this. Um, right. Let's first observe that proving this is enough. Right. Um, by LP duality, we know that the optimal value of the primal is the optimal value of the dual and the primal is exactly the max flow problem right the max flow problem by by its nature is not uh, not a very discrete problem like some other problems right so it's directly a linear program we don't need an integer linear program for it right because the capacities are um, yeah anyways you get the point the x vector is does not need to be an integral vector for the max flow problem Right. So this is exactly the LP for the max flow problem. Right. And by LP duality, its optimal value is equal to the optimal value of the dual. However, now I'm saying that the optimal value of dual is exactly the minimum capacity of an ST die cut. Therefore, the maximum ST flow value is exactly equal to the minimum capacity of an ST die cut. Okay. So Observe that proving the claim proves the max flow min cut theorem. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, we are also using integrality because optimal solutions of the dual, we know that there are integral optimal solutions. So we will deal with integral optimal solutions in order to show this claim. Okay. By integrality of the dual, we uh, we may deal with integral optimal solutions to the dual. Okay. All right. So let's see how do we do this. All right. <clears throat> So first, let's take any integral optimal solution to the dual. Let y bar z bar denote any integral optimal solution to the dual. Okay. So basically we have a solution where all the y bar z bar entries are integers and it is also an optimal solution for the dual right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use this solution to define an st die cut and i'm going to show to you that the value of this solution is at least the capacity of that die cut therefore it has to be at least the minimum capacity of any die st die cut okay so we will Construct an ST die cut uh, partial plus of W such that the value of this solution with respect to the dual, so this is basically summation CZE, uh, right, is at least the capacity of this die cut. Okay, so that means I need to tell you what is the set W and therefore what is its complement. Okay, notice that in our dual, the S variable, uh, YS variable has been set to minus one and YT has been set to zero. This contains the hint of what we should do. Okay, remember we want our set W to contain S and we don't want it to contain T. So any ideas on how we should define W? We are going to use these Y variables, the Y bar variables to define our set W. We want it to contain S, we don't want it to contain T. Okay, so here's the idea. We are going to take all the variables, all the vertices whose y bar variables are negative. That is going to be our set W. Okay. And all the others are going to be W complement. So define W as all the vertices such that the y bar variable is less than or equal to minus one, which basically means that they are negative. Okay, and observe that that S belongs to set W and T does not belong to W. So the presentation stopped. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, let me share again. So. Okay, now is it okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, I might have clicked something by mistake. Sorry. Okay, so right. So this is how we are defining the set W. And by our definition, we get that S belongs to the set W and T does not belong to W. Okay. All right. Um, now let's see what happens to our constraints. Sorry, what's going on here? Oh, I see. Uh,
Okay, then give me one second. Something has copy pasted automatically to my. Okay, yeah. All right. Okay, so I claim that this cut, its capacity is less than equal to the value of this solution. Okay, so let's see why this is true. So observe that if you take any arc of this cut, so this is my set W, and this is W bar, S is over here, T is over here. So now let's suppose we take any arc which is in this cut. Okay, it could be incident at S or T, it doesn't matter because we have already unified the constraints. So consider some UV which is in this cut in partial plus of W. Okay, uh, what does the constraint say? The constraint says that ZUV is greater than or equal to YV minus YU. This implies that Z bar UV is greater than or equal to y bar v minus y bar u. Okay. Now note that all these vertices, the dual variable is at least zero. That is how we defined w and w bar. And all these vertices, the dual variable is at most minus one. Okay. So I have something that is non-negative, and I'm subtracting something. That is strictly negative from it. Therefore, this quantity is at least one. Does everybody agree? Right? So, for all arcs in this particular set, partial plus of W, the Z bar value will be set to at least one. Right? Oh, but that's good because. What is the value of our y bar z bar? It is the summation of all C, E, Z, E, right? So the value of our optimal solution is exactly the summation of all arcs, right? Uh, and in particular, all the arcs that are in this um, cut their variable has been set to at least one and the costs are on uh, all the capacities. Remember, they are non negative. Therefore, this summation will be at least the sum of. All the arcs in this cut. The capacities of these arcs and that is exactly the capacity of this cut. OK. So what we have shown is that I took any integral optimal solution and I showed you that there is a cut and this solution, its value is greater than or equal to the capacity of this cut. Well, but if it is true for this cut, then it also has to be true for the cut with minimum capacity, right? In particular, the value of y bar z bar is at least the capacity of min st cut. Oh, and y bar z bar, remember, it was an optimal integral solution to the dual, which means that the optimal solution of the dual, right? So we have shown one thing. We have shown that the optimal solution, optimal value of the dual is greater than or equal to the min ST die cut capacity. Right? We want to show equality. We have shown one thing so far. Are there any questions or concerns so far? Does everybody see what we did? We started with a dual solution, which is an integral optimal solution. We know an integral optimal solution exists because the dual is integral. We use totally unimodular matrices for that part, right? And from that integral optimal solution, we defined a cut and we argued that this particular solution, its value is greater than or equal to the capacity of the cut that we defined, but then it has to be greater than or equal to the minimum ST die cut capacity, right? So we get this inequality. So now it remains to show
that the optimal value of the dual is less than or equal to the min ST die cut capacity. All right. So I'm going to tell you how to go about this and uh, leave it as an exercise. It's not too difficult. It's basically sort of reversing what we did. Okay. So now let's take an, a minimum ST uh, die cut and let us show that its capacity is greater than or equal to the optimal value of the dual. So consider a min ST die cut, say partial plus of W. Okay. So by definition, S belongs to W and T does not belong to W. Okay. So this time we are starting with a ST die cut. And what we want to do is we want to construct a feasible solution, an integral feasible solution for the dual. Okay. And we want to show that its value is going to be less than or equal to the capacity of the cut that we have chosen. Okay. So the plan is to construct an integral feasible solution to the dual LP, say Y bar, Z bar, and show that the capacity of the cut that we have chosen is greater than equal to the value of y bar z bar right which is exactly the summation of all the arcs c times z e okay so this is what we want to do we want to use this cut to construct our feasible solution for the dual. Any thoughts on how we should do this? In some sense, we want to reverse what we just did in the forward direction. So how should we define uh, our dual feasible solution using the cut that we are given? And let me show you the dual. The dual looks like this, right? So I'll just write down the main points. Um, yu minus yv plus zuv is at least zero, right? So let's just we want ys to be set to minus one. We want yt to be set to zero, and we want all the z's to be non-negative. So can you use the given cut to define a Y bar Z bar that will satisfy all of these conditions? Okay, let me ask you this. What should I set these variables to? So for all the vertices in W, what should I set their Y bar to? S is already minus one because that is a constant. What about the other vertices? Should I also set them to minus one?
Well, that's exactly what we are going to do. We are going to set all the variables for the vertices in W to minus one. We are going to set all the variables for the vertices not in W to zero. Um, right? Remember the Y variables are free variables. We can do whatever we like with them. So long as we make sure that then the Z's are set to satisfy the constraints and that all the Z's are non-negative. Okay? So, um, for all vertices in W, set the Y bar variable to be zero. For all vertices not in W, set the Y bar variable, sorry, uh, not zero, minus one. Minus one and set all of these guys to zero. Okay? Now, observe that if an arc is completely contained in one of the two sides, then what does this constraint say? This constraint says, that the Z bar variable for that arc should be greater than or equal to zero, right? Because both the U and V have the same Y bar because the, both the side, both the vertices are either on the left side or either on the right side. So that just means that for these arcs, I can set the Z bar to be zero. The only arcs that are interesting are arcs that are going from the left side to the right side. For those arcs, I need the Z bar UV to be greater than or equal to y bar v minus y bar u. Right? And that is the right hand side variable has been set to 0 and the left hand side variable has been set to minus 1. So that is 1. So I need all of these guys to be plus 1 or at least plus 1. So I'm going to set them exactly plus 1. And for all the other arcs, I'm going to set them to be zero, and that will be a feasible solution for the dual, right? So for all arcs, uh, for all, let's say, u comma v, in my cut, in my die cut, I will set the y bar, sorry, not y bar, z bar. I'll set z bar uv to be exactly equal to one, and for all other arcs, so these are arcs, which are in the graph, but they are not in this die cut, I will set the Z bar variable to be exactly zero. And I claim that this is a dual feasible solution. You can check that easily. Okay. And now I will leave it to you to show that the capacity of the cut is at least the value of this dual solution that we have defined, and that will complete the proof. Okay. So, do it yourself. One, show that Y bar Z bar is a dual feasible solution. And second, uh, show that the capacity of our cut is greater than or equal to the value of this solution, right? Which is simply the summation of C, E, Z, E for all the arcs, okay? It's not difficult. Once you do this, you are done because uh, that would imply that the capacity of this cut has to be greater than or equal to the optimal value, right? If it is greater than or equal to one value, the value of one dual feasible solution, it also has to be greater than or equal to the optimal value because it is a minimization problem, right? And that's it. That is exactly what we wanted to show. So this would imply that the capacity of the cut All right. So that's it. That is the proof of the max flow min cut theorem using LP duality. So we have seen two proofs. We saw one proof using um, incrementing paths. That is a combinatorial proof. And this is the second proof that is using LP duality and integrality of polyhedra. All right. Are there any questions or concerns at this point? Okay, if not, 
let me move to a new page. So I want to give you a couple of try it yourself problems, which I wanted to put on the assignment, but then the assignment would be too long. So. Um, you might have seen Menger's theorems in your previous graph theory courses. If you haven't, you can read about it. So you can try using the max flow min cut theorem. To prove. Um, Menger's theorem. There are lots of Menger's theorem, so you can pick any one of them and try it. Um, right, so this you want to revisit graph theory. You might have seen it in your graph theory course. Um, on your assignment five, you will be proving the Koenig Agarwari theorem. So that is using um, that is an algorithmic way of proving it. But another way to do it which is not allowed on the assignment is to use the max flow min cut theorem to prove the Koenig-Egarwari theorem. So I'll tell you what the theorem is because I want to discuss further in this direction. So the Koenig-Egarwari theorem says that in bipartite graphs, The maximum matching cardinality is equal to the cardinality of a minimum vertex cover. Right, and we have discussed vertex cover previously on this course, or also on the assignment. So I'm not going to define it right now. Okay. Um, yeah. So there are multiple ways to prove it. Um, right on the assignment, you will be doing an algorithmic proof. And another way to do it is using max flow min cut. The point I want to make here is that in this course, we have seen lots of min max results starting all the way from LP duality. LP duality itself is telling you that the maximum value of a certain maximization problem is equal to the minimum value of a certain minimization problem, right? But then you also have these combinatorial min max results about combinatorial objects like matchings and vertex cover. Um, or max flow and min st cut capacity, right? Um, so that's sort of the theme of this last module. I wanted to focus on these min max results. Uh, but when you see this result, the Koenig Eckerwari theorem, it's natural to ask what about non bipartite graphs? Is there a similar result? Is there a similar min max result for non bipartite? graphs maximum matchings, right? So the question is, is there a min max theorem for maximum matchings in non bipartite graphs? Well, as you expect, the answer is yes. Um, I don't think there is a way to prove it using max flow min cut. In fact, I'm reasonably confident that such a proof is not known. And uh, for all I for all I know, it may not even exist. Um, so it turns out that non bipartite matchings is really different from bipartite matchings, as we have seen throughout this course. Uh, there is a min max theorem which I want to tell you about today and tomorrow. I am not sure we will complete the proof, but we will try to, or we might just go over time a bit. Okay. So there is a result. The thing is you don't want to focus on vertex cover. Vertex cover is not the right thing to look at when you are going from bipartite graphs to non-bipartite graphs. A similar thing happened when we were considering perfect matchings. In bipartite graphs, we had these deficient sets, but that was not the right thing to look at when we went to non bipartite graphs. In non bipartite graphs, we were we instead looked at what are called touch sets. So in the same sense, uh, rather than looking at vertex cover, we are going to look at a different concept. Okay, and it will remind you of touch theorem for perfect matchings. So maybe let me start a new page. Are there any questions or concerns so far?
Okay, if not, let's move on to our last and final topic for this course. Um, it is called the Tut Berge formula. Okay. So let me try to prove the easy direction of this formula today. Uh, that should not be difficult. Yeah. All right. So let G be any graph. Okay. And the discussion we are going to have is going to remind you of Tut's theorem. Consider a matching M and consider a set of vertices. I want to relate the size of this matching to something related to the set of vertices that I have chosen, which is an, any arbitrary set of vertices. Okay, so if you delete a set of vertices from a graph, your graph might disconnect into components, or it may not, but the discussion we are having will apply to both situations. Okay, so let us assume for the sake of generality that it disconnects into some components, some of these components might be odd and some of these components might be even. Okay, so these are my odd components of G minus S and these are my even components of G minus S. All right. But relating the matching cardinality directly to this situation is not that easy. It's not that obvious. What is much more obvious is to relate the number of exposed vertices. Okay, so let me ask you. What can you say? About. The number, okay, maybe let me use a definition. Let's say you is the set of M exposed vertices. What can you say about the cardinality of this set in this particular situation? So what do I have in this situation? I have four vertices in the set S. I have six odd components as per my drawing. And let me make it more interesting by creating five even components, but the even components are not going to matter, okay? So you've got four vertices in S and six odd components and some number of even components. So what can you say about the number of M exposed vertices in this particular situation? I claim that you can give me a lower bound. Can someone give me a lower bound? on the number of M exposed vertices. We might go up to 6 p.m. today. I want to complete the easy part of the tut berge formula and we'll do the difficult part tomorrow. Okay, let me ask you this. Can this graph have a perfect matching? Can you apply Tut's theorem and tell me whether this graph can have a perfect matching? No. No, right? Because we have too many odd components. The, the theorem says that the number of odd components has to be less than equal to the cardinality of the set S. Okay, so we will have at least one M exposed vertex because the graph does not have a perfect matching. So can you make this stronger? I claim that you can make it stronger. Shantani, any thoughts?
there are four vertices in the set S, and there are six odd components. I claim that it's between a... number of odd components and vertices in exactly, this. exactly. So we will have at least two. So in this particular situation, the cardinality of the m exposed vertices, so the set will be at least two, because for each odd component, you can't match all the vertices here. There'll be one vertex left because it has an odd number of vertices and that vertex will have to go here. The same thing happens for every odd component, but there are only four vertices over here, but you have six odd components. So at least two odd components will be unlucky. Right? So more generally, the number of M exposed vertices is at least the number of odd components minus the cardinality of the set S. Okay. Are there any questions? Everybody agree with this? So now I want to relate this set to the size of the matching. How would we do that? Can somebody tell me how are cardinality of U and cardinality of M related? They are related through the number of vertices, right? So if I give you a matching and there are some exposed vertices, well, then the total number of vertices in the graph is two times the number of edges in the matching plus the number of exposed vertices, right? So the total number of vertices is two times this plus this. Right? Which means that the cardinality of the matching is the number of vertices minus this divided by two. Oh, but this we know, this is at least the number of odd components minus the size of the set. So therefore, this quantity, sorry. Um, yeah, wait a second. Yeah, so let me just replace this by the number of vertices minus Okay, and what is the inequality I should put here? Right. Notice that we we are subtracting something that could potentially be lesser. Right. So therefore, wait a second. I'm also confused. So what do we get here? At most. At most. Right. Yeah, supposing we were subtracting, let's say the cardinality of U was 5. Now we could be subtracting something which would be 3, right? So it is less than equal to, right? Because you're subtracting something that is um, strictly less than or less than or equal to the original cardinality U, right? So we have this formula. So always we know that the cardinality of the matching is upper bounded by this quantity. Right? In particular, if I take a maximum matching and I take a set S which minimizes this quantity, I know that the size of the maximum matching is going to be less than equal to the size of any such set, the, the quantity for any such set. Right? In other words, if I take cardinality of M where M is any matching, Maybe let me put it this way. Let me choose the maximum over all matchings. Right? 
And on the right hand side, let me choose the minimum of this particular uh, quantity, which is the number of vertices minus the number of odd components plus the cardinality of the set divided by two over all sets of the vertices. The tut Birch formula says that this is not less than or equal to, this is an equality. Okay. So this always holds with equality. And that is the tut Birch formula. Okay. So this is what, what we need to prove is the other direction, right? We need to show that there is always a set S that achieves this equation with the maximum matching. Okay. And uh, one thing you can do yourself is the following. It's quite easy. Uh, maybe I'll give you two problems to do yourself. One is use tut Berge formula to prove Tut's theorem. Tut's perfect matching theorem that we discussed earlier in the course. And second, um, use the tut Berge formula to prove the konig agarwari theorem. So it turns out that it is a right generalization of the konig agarwari theorem. Okay, and we will try to complete a proof of this tomorrow. And that will be the last lecture, the 50th lecture. Okay, so that's all for today. Um, are there any questions or concerns? Okay, so I guess there is nobody in the meeting, so let me stop recording.